We'll get started here with the uh, CX leaders and a CX career professional uh, panel here. So uh, really excited about this one. I mentioned this last year at CXPS, the fastest growing trend in business is the rise of the CX professional as a dedicated title. So we've got four professionals up here who have CX in their title and uh, we're gonna just have a conversation with them. Uh, get your QR codes ready or go to polyv.com and join so that you can be asking your questions as we go through the panel. Uh, we've got about 30 minutes of questions prepared and we've got an hour, so we're definitely leaning on you guys for some of those questions. So uh, get ready for that. And we're going to start out here with uh, just some introductions. So if each of you would just briefly introduce yourself, your company, your title, and um, just and what's your CX story? I'll start. Uh, I am Mallory, Director of Customer Experience at Power Design. So we are a national multi-trade contractor and design firm. Uh, I completely fell into CX. Uh, we started doing it without knowing there was a name. And I think, I think that's pretty similar to everybody, right? We all are customer service. We all want happy customers. And before we knew it, we realized that we were, we had a whole CX program, learned about it and started fine-tuning and formalizing the department. Great, I'm Carl Winstead uh, with Klein Design Associates. We're a, um, a Raleigh and Charlotte-based uh, architecture firm, uh, land, land planning and interiors, and I've been with the firm five years, and I actually get to wear three titles. Um, they are partner, architect, and CXO, and you can guess which one is the most current and newest um, <laughs> is, is CXO. And in, um, in, in our office, as we developed what uh, the need for that or what we thought the need was, uh, for us, CXO really is a little bit of everything. Um, it is client experience, it's the staff experience, and it's a little piece of business development. So it's got, a, um, it, it's got some interesting um, legs and tentacles to it. All right, thank you. Sid? Hi there, good afternoon everybody. Uh, Sid Abrams, I am Client Experience Officer at Nonprofit HR. We are a national professional services firm that does HR consulting for social impact organizations, so nonprofits, associations, and foundations. Um, I'm an HR guy by background and by education and training, um, have been with this firm for about 15 years and was asked uh, about October of last year to take on uh, a CXO role, not knowing what CX was. Um, so it's been a, a quite a learning journey for the past six months, and um, I'm excited to share more about uh, that with you all this afternoon. And I'm Dan Herbener. I work for Benish Law. We're a business law firm located out of Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, 350 attorneys, I know I said this earlier, but um, I work as a CX analyst there. Um, I had no background in CX either when I first started. Um, it was a situation where I was a business development specialist, went to our CMO team and just said, hey, I kind of want to get more involved with the client side, client development. And then a couple weeks later, this position was kind of just handed to me. So it's been an interesting ride, but happy to be here. Great. And so each of you came into this a little bit differently, and you're all a first-generation CX leaders uh, in your first official CX role. So uh, tell me a little bit more about your background in CX, and, and though some of you are new to this, you, know, you didn't just fall into this. You had some precursors that set you up for success in CX. Tell me a little bit about that. So I actually came from the operations side of our business. I was in uh, project management for a while. I worked in, uh, worked for the director of operations at the time. So I got to get very hands-on with budgets, how our operations work, the processes, etc. cetera. Uh, I actually left the company. I had to move, so I relocated. The owner of the company was not able to go to the job sites anymore himself, but he's very passionate about the, about the job. You know, if it was up to him, he would go to every job and check in with the uh, clients. So they asked if I would step in and start just calling our clients, see how we're doing. That's where we started with CX. And before we knew it, those turned into interviews and we were doing them on every project. Uh, and that feedback has been part of our culture now for seven years, right. major part. 
you may have heard the song "The Long and Winding Road." Um, <laughs> You know, I, for almost, almost 25 years, I had my own firm here in the Triangle area, a small firm. Um, but one of the pieces, of, and, and there I was the sort of the, the chief officer of everything. Um, and it was. It was everything from being on the boards, drawing, designing, meeting with clients, um, invoicing, marketing, all of that. So um, years of kind of just grueling through everything. Um, and then it, one of the things I developed an interest in was Greek housing, which may sound kind of odd. But what I found myself doing is I was spending a lot of time with Greek organizations on college campuses, really kind of navigating um, bureaucracy of a college campus, uh, bureaucracy of an organization, um, emotions of an alumni group, so all kinds of things. And I realized that I was kind of developing this interest in sort of like navigating all of that. That was almost becoming as much fun as doing the, the building design part. And that led me to really kind of getting in a bunch of leadership reading, and that's the only formal training I've had. Um, I had this opportunity literally five years ago to basically leave my own firm but join as a partner with this larger group. And as we were looking at our leadership and our, um, our, 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 mark, our strategy for, for moving on with organization, we really kind of developed this, this role. Um, and, you know, we, we just, we're, again, we're learning it and, you know, but I, my training, I'm, I'm young in my journey, so. Right. Great. I, I think if there is an ideal path that I, if, for anybody to take, I think I took it. So I started off at nonprofit HR as a senior consultant doing 100% client facing work, um, ended up running that team for about seven years and then shifted into business development. So I spent about two and a half years in the business development side. So really touching all the various touch points that a client would have through the life cycle. What I didn't realize, and in hindsight looking back, was I kind of started a client experience program about four years ago. We called it QOS, so quality of service. And after a project was done, we had this super janky survey monkey survey that we would <laughs> send out to clients and just get a sense for how we did. Um, and we use that data to, you know, kind of learn about the experience, but it was very in an informal way. There was no kind of scientific methodology to it, but recognizing that we did do a little bit of CX um, a, a few years back. So having the perspective of being on the client side, doing the client work, um, and then moving into business development, I thought is kind of an ideal path to be able to see all sides of that client life cycle and moving into this kind of now formal CX operation. All right. I think for me, um, certainly the reason why my role is, was created is twofold. Um, I didn't have any CX background. I had worked in corporate communications for a metals and manufacturing company before I joined Benish as a business development specialist. So I'd seen some of the pitch and proposal work that we'd done. Um, but our firm was growing like crazy at the beginning of the pandemic for whatever reason, there was just a higher demand for legal services. Um, so between that and then we also had our client assessment program, we had all these key, key client account pipelines and we had done the baseline survey with client savvy. So we had all of these client feedback efforts going on at once and we were growing like crazy. So it was kind of the idea that we need somebody to come in and organize all of this stuff and sort of be the liaison for all the client experience, client feedback, client service efforts that we're putting forward. So it really was kind of right place at the right time. but. Here I am, happy to be here. All right, and uh, talking to each of you before this, you all have some projects, some CX initiatives in flight. I'm sure the audience would love to hear what you're working on right now, what you're striving towards, and, and maybe what's coming up next. I take for granted, I was talking about this earlier, uh, is living in this world, I tend to think about all of the things we're not doing yet. Um, I know there's a lot of people in here who say, that you're like, oh, we want more, right? Oh, I wish we could do that. I wish we could put that in place. I had to sit back while I was here and say, holy, like, we're actually doing a lot of things right. We have a lot of these in place. We have the framework and the structure. Uh, we have everywhere from, if it's new business or maintaining the relationships, there's processes. We have events. We host these massive tours, which are huge, uh, huge sellers. We have clients, vendors now coming in to visit our facilities. Uh, our feedback program is part of every project. Every project team will see that feedback. So I interviewed Dan over there about how his experience with our company went. 
that feedback gets summarized, lessons learned, gets sent to the entire company. Uh, the owner himself will call you. If it's not great, there's a jet going out tomorrow to fix that relationship before it gets too bad. That's, that's the biggest one we have. Uh, and then, let's see, we're now starting to branch out into our different different disciplines. So we're starting our engineering feedback surveys, uh, system surveys, different pieces of work, focusing more on that. I would say if anybody in the room hasn't started a CX program or you're really new to it, um, don't be afraid of it and be patient. I think one of my biggest projects right now is really education. Um, it's education for myself. So this is a great event. Um, so thank you for all that I'm learning here. Um, but I think it's also, it's an education for the firm. I think as, especially in a, in, a, in a setting where you're used to providing professional services, you know how to provide those, right? You know how to put a billing together. You know how to pro project management, how to stay on a budget, how to, how to see problems in the field. You know all that. And that's all familiar territory. And you can talk that all day long and everybody in the room nods their head, yeah, I got it. Um, and understanding that, that, that CX is something different um, and, it's, and, it, and, it's, and, it's, and it is different than just marketing. Um, so one of my projects right now is really, um, I've started a weekly um, kind of a conversation at a, at a meeting that we have with, with all the partners and, and team leaders where we're just discussing topics. I mean, we're actually starting to use your card deck um, as a way just to get people to start thinking about it. Um, and then we're working with sort of client, our goal is really by in, in the, the early fall to start doing a, you know, a listing tour. So we're starting, starting to build some database and, and do that together. But again, I think for us right now, our biggest thing is it's educating ourselves and getting people to start thinking um, about CX in a way that they're so used to thinking about everything else. Right. Yeah, I, I would concur with a lot of that around the education. Um, as you can imagine, we are fairly early in our CX journey. Um, so we have just concluded about 30 days ago our first baseline survey with Client Savvy. Um, we've got that data. We've now done some initial assessment of it. Uh, we're ready to have our onboarding uh, towards the end of this month. So we'll be kind of designing now that strategy and really working on education. So one of the interesting things that we've done is we, uh, we're a fully remote organization of about 130 staff. Um, and we have biweekly <coughs> staff meetings. We do a half an hour um, Zoom calls. And one of the things we do in each of those calls is we always have one or two slides that are dedicated to CX, right? So it's a little piece of education, it's data sharing, it's kind of terms and definitions, it's uh, what are the project plans that we have coming up. So it's a lot of education, it's trying to socialize within the organization what this new term is, what does it mean, why should it not be scary to you, um, trying to debunk some of the myths out there that people may have about it. So it's about education, but we're early in our journey. Um, we'll be doing client listening tours coming up here soon and really putting in the hard work to understand the current perceptions and experiences of our clients that will help inform and shape our strategy and then tactics uh, over the next six to 24 months. Right. Sure, so obviously I mentioned a few that we have going on a little bit earlier during my talk about our client assessment program. I mean, that takes up a good amount of our time to begin with. We're trying to launch um, quarterly feedback surveys with client savvy, client savvy, also end and mid matter check-ins. But the more that we try and launch these pilot projects uh, with, and I have discussions with some senior leadership, the more I feel the need that we have to kind of sort of go back and establish what those building blocks are for our CX program. So it goes back to what you guys were talking about with education, showing the attorneys that this client, that what client experience is in the first place and how valuable it can be to our business, I think is the most important step for us right now. We'll continue to try and collect feedback through these different efforts, but the more we can show that business value, I think the easier it will be to start to get some of these projects off the ground. All right, All right, well, thank you guys. Okay, I'm gonna chime in on that because we didn't, we've. We did not do a great job with that when we first started. Uh, so getting on a common language is, I would recommend that to anybody. Otherwise you will sit there and have a conversation about CX and what does that mean? Somebody's talking about an event, someone's talking about feedback. So I would, what you guys are doing, I wish we did more up front because now we're backtracking and now trying to push it through. Good lesson learned. All right. 
Uh, I got one question for each of you, um, and of course anyone else can uh, color commentate, but Sid, uh, talk to me about the uh, business driver behind why nonprofit HR created the CXO role and launched on a CX program. Absolutely. Um, so our firm, uh, we've been around 23 years. Um, I've been here for about 15 of those 23 years. Uh, we were six employees when I started. At the beginning of the pandemic, we were like 50, 51, and we're 130 today. So that the growth for the first 20 years of our firm was incredibly intentional, managed, and done in a very high quality way. We were able to really ensure high level quality experiences, and that led to high retention and referrals and whatnot. Um, over the course of the pandemic, um, as we almost tripled in size, you know, we saw a resulting kind of decrease in client quality, right? It was harder to maintain that level of quality through that rapid growth period. So we started to see slippage in terms of client renewals and client referrals and just some of the feedback that came back, um, which was very much, you know, things that could be corrected with more intentionality around training and providing the right level of expectations and accountabilities for anybody who was client facing. So uh, at the end of last year, we decided to do a little bit of a reorganization. And essentially, we reorganized our leadership and our firm around three pillars. Um, we re, uh, retitled our head of HR as our uh, head of employee experience. Uh, I wear the hat of head of client experience, and we have our CFO. And what we've done is essentially any new initiative within the firm, unless it furthers the goals of EX, CX, or financial impact, we don't do it. So that's now the filter through which any new initiative, any new project, any new idea is put through. Um, and it all kind of resulted out of this growth, which spurned kind of the need to really reevaluate and define what are the set of expectations, how do we engage with clients, and then making sure we kind of get back to that level of excellence that was our hallmark for the first 20 years. All right. Uh, Carl, you have three titles. So um, as you're transitioning into the CXO, how did you or how are you letting go of the old titles? How are you managing the, uh, wearing those multiple hats? Well, you're looking at the worst person right here who gets in the way of all of that. Um, anybody, and that's a good question, because I think anybody who has sort of moved from one, from one role to another, it, it, you, you sort of spend time with what you know and what you're used to doing. It's, that's the easy part. And I think for me personally, as, as a person trained as an architect, I have spent my whole career designing buildings and seeing them constructed. And, and that's part of how I value um, my day. That's how I know I've put in a good day's work. Um, and so sort of shifting from not being in the day-to-day -day design and, and working has been a really, has been kind of a difficult thing. I'm lucky that our leadership, and, and I'm lucky to be part of the ownership, so we helped create this. So, it's, so we have the backing that, yes, Carl, you need to get out of projects. Um, but I have clients who still think that I'm their go-to person. I got a call here just yesterday that we have a project manager that's leaving, and now I'm going to have to inherit. So it's, it's, it's hard to do it. But you have to. You just, you just, you really have to. And um, I've had to learn how to say no. Um, tell a client that I know we've worked together for for, for 10, 15 years. Um, I'm not leaving you. I'm putting you in good hands. I'm here, um, but I'm here in a different role to con to continue to for you to, to still have that positive feeling about your project. Um, but it it's 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 difficult. But if you if you don't, you will spend your days still in the. Uh, in the trap. Yeah. Well, as uh, someone myself who left architecture to go do CX, I can certainly relate to the idea of sitting back at the end of the day and wondering what did I actually accomplish because there's no lines on a piece of paper. And uh, Dan, you shared something in our conversation leading up to this. How do you look back and, and measure what you've done, what you've accomplished, and feel like that, oh, that was a good day's work? Yeah, I mean, I think that's been one of the hardest parts of sort of shifting my mentality of what my role is because just you know from a personal perspective I'm someone who likes to check boxes like to you know task oriented get things done on to the next but obviously with CX it's not a box that you can check I mean if you have clients you have client experience right 
Um, so right now it's been it's been difficult since we're early in the process to correlate the quantitative, you know, revenue growth, client retention, things of that nature, with the qualitative, you know, the stories that we hear about. We solve X problem for X client and it had X outcome. You know, there have been a few of those stories, but I think for me the mentality shift has been, you know. It's a law firm, they're slow to make changes. If they're even considering some of the projects that we're trying to get off the ground here, that's successful to me. So certainly <laughs> difficult, certainly a mind shift, but sometimes you just have to step back and understand that uh, some of these companies move at a glacier's pace and the fact that you're chipping away at all is progress and is success. Yeah, my co-founding partner often said it's like pushing a mule up a ladder, and I don't think there's a better analogy sometimes for getting CX done. You talked about uh, um, some of the measurable results and the impacts that CX is having. So, uh, Mel, that's something you talked about was how do you get funding, how do you get resources? You know, we're in organizations where time is money, and even though we all talk about value-based pricing and everything else, you talk about trying to train a hundred attorneys on CX and people are thinking that's, you know, $600 an hour times a hundred attorneys times four hours. And it's just hard to get out of that mindset. So how do you get resources to do this? I leverage the resources that are already existing. Cause again, customer service isn't new. Your teams already have that mindset. So going to find uh, your internal networks and it's, it's finding who's going to one be your promoter. So take, so take that philosophy, right? Go look for your raving fans. Go find the people who will help you get the buy-in that you need. So maybe it's not directly your supervisor. Maybe it's going to the operations manager and saying, how would I be able to help you achieve your goals? That person can then also be your advocate and push for the change that you're looking for. And then a lot of times, again, it's not budget. Sometimes you don't need it. But that was a lesson I had to learn. I don't have to do everything new. Sometimes it's tweaking an existing process, changing. Our, uh, we have a team of executive representatives that are really our relationship managers at the higher level. Sometimes it's as simple as asking them to just check a box. So now I have that data point. They're already having the conversations. How do I leverage that information? Great. All right. And I see some questions are coming in. So this is wonderful. And I know this might be a bit hard to read. So I've, I've got them up here. I'm not like browsing Facebook, guys. I'm, uh, I'm reading your questions here. So top, a top voted question right now. Uh, what tips uh, do you have for someone trying to lead CX from the wrong seat in the organization? Can I ask why it's the wrong seat? That's, that's a good question. So maybe leading from the middle. Yeah. A non-CX title. Yeah. Maybe executive leadership isn't drinking the CX Kool-Aid yet, but you are. Sure, I, I'm happy to jump in on this one because I am far from an executive at my firm here. <laughs> um, but certainly that's a, a challenge. You know, I'm the only person in our organization who has CX in their title. I was lucky enough that our chief strategy officer and our CMO were completely bought in on client experience as something that we needed. I think that, you know, when I came here last year, I really didn't know a lot about CX, but the more that I went to the different programs and things, it makes so much sense, right? It's just, you have to have somebody who can actually communicate what CX actually is and how you can put it into practice. So I think the more that you can just continually educate yourself on what CX is and become um, really adequate at communicating it to leadership, I think that it's it's just absolutely a no-brainer, especially for, for professional services firms. I mean, we were talking about there's a bunch of law firms that can do the exact same work that our lawyers can do. Don't tell our lawyers that I said that. <laughs> um, but a, a differentiator is the client experience. If you give the client a great experience, then they're going to want to they're going to want to buy from you in the first place, and they're going to want to keep buying from you. So. I think one of the arguments that we had too is that it's, it's really, really simple, right? Especially as a professional services firm, you only have two resources that you get to work with. It's your people, your staff, and it's, and it's your clients. And if you lose or mess up either one of those, then you have no business. You, you cannot, it cannot function without either one of those resources. And so I, I think that was for us as a really good point of saying there, there is no really 
way to avoid this. It doesn't make business sense. Um, we need to pay attention and focus and, and make both of those things really important because we don't have a business and paychecks with, with either one of them awry. Right. Yeah. And then the only thing I would add to it is use the data that you either can capture or have already captured to support those decisions and to get those folks who do have decision-making power to put the data in their hands. So, for example, you know, Blake talked yesterday about the CX gap, right, about the difference between what <laughs> CEOs' perceptions uh, were and what their clients' realities were, right? It was very stark. Um, or, you know, are you capturing any data from your clients during uh, or after engagements to support uh, the investment in CX? And I think, as you all talked about, it's not hard stuff, right? It just takes the intentionality and then commitment to start small, doing things like, you know, uh, some of the tips that Andrea had shared yesterday and today about, you know, saying thank you and uh, the, the things that don't cost anything. Start with some of those low cost or no cost strategies, get some momentum, and then, then you can kind of use that to make the business case for, okay, can I get a small budget? Now can I grow that and grow that, so on and so forth. I want to chime in on that too because there is a, my team, we were very, very tiny. It was me and one other person interviewing every single project four times. Uh, so what we did is we created a lot of hype around what we do. So, and beyond, you know, we, again, the whole company sees our results. That's great. We celebrate these big wins as an organization. But as we were losing some of that visibility because we became very stable in the organization, we were getting great feedback. Attention started to focus somewhere else in the organization. We were feeling a little left behind. Uh, so we, we went on an intentional campaign of activities. We were posting and raving about certain employees who have gone above and beyond. We were going to them and thanking them. We were asking them how they did it. Then they tell you the rest of the story that, you know, oh yeah, I did this. That person came in and guess what we're doing next week? Awesome, now that person is proud of what they did. They're more intentional of what they're doing. And so we, we actually did a like grassroots spreading of energy towards it. And that helped us a lot, really get that momentum and buy-in back in. Great. There's some really good questions here. Um, let's see, the other one that's been upvoted a couple times. Uh, can you describe performance metrics and utilization expectations for your CX staff? Yeah, it always comes back to utilization, doesn't it? No. <laughs> if you know the answer. So, so in our firm, we, we don't even use that word anymore. It's just called the dirty U word, right? I think there's been so it. much over-focus <clears throat> on utilization um, that it, re it really has lost its effectiveness. So for us, what we've done is we have brought our resource and project planning team into the CX kind of world and ensuring that as we're building out portfolios and we are uh, you know, setting up new projects and building projects teams, that instead of focusing on utilization, which of course is a backwards looking metric, we're really looking at what is the optimal number of clients or hours somebody can have that can support strong client experience, right? So we're using it, we're driving it from the CX perspective as opposed to solely the utilization perspective. Now, we, we are, you know, we're, we are a fairly small firm, so we don't have some of the same, perhaps, pressures that others may have from a billable time perspective. Um, but for us, it's been about shifting the conversation solely from numerically driven to more qualitatively driven. Um, and then as we are getting feedback from clients, uh, whereas there is perhaps some constructive feedback, we're not using it in a punitive way. We are using it to bring in our EX team and how are we going to create learning opportunities for staff who may have, you know, areas for development. So we had, as an example, during our client listening, uh, one of our listening conversations as a follow-up to the baseline survey, a client had a, a particularly not a great experience with one of our consultants in terms of uh, their engagement with some candidates that they were working with. So what we ended up doing was meeting with the head of that division and bringing in our EX uh, liaisons and identifying, we, we use a lot of LinkedIn learning, so what are some of the learning journeys that we can create for her within that platform to be able to support growth and development towards getting up to that CX uh, kind of place of excellence? We haven't yet defined what those are, we're still early in that journey, but in the meantime, we were using kind of that data to drive qualitative improvement. Very cool. All right, um, 
What roles in your organization support CX and EX efforts? And what future roles do you plan to add? I'd like to argue that they all do, right? <laughs> uh, how we interact with each other is going to impact it all. Everybody has a customer where you work, but... Uh, so roles specifically, we do have a uh, executive representative team. Again, those are the relationship drivers at the higher level. Uh, we've got our feedback team. Uh, we also have an engagement team. The engagement team is the one who is creating the events and those special touch points with the clients on an individual level or at a larger level. And then our, I love how you renamed it your uh, HR department. We also have done that too. So our entire HR department is actually called The Source which means that they are the source for everything. Uh, and we have made it, so if you have a question, if I don't know where my P card, my credit card is, I could just email that account and they will help me. They will take care of it. So in that sense, uh, we really do have a corporate culture of everybody is in a CX position or an EX position. We're all responsible for the experience. I know we're young and our, our development, but I would say that for me, my biggest support is coming from my, my partners, um, but also our director of marketing and our director of HR. I mean, those are right now the, 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 the key people that are really kind of working with me specifically. Um, I think what I have begun to realize and learn, especially this conference, is that we do need, it, it, one person really can't continue to do all this for 130 people and then multiple offices and you know, the separation of EX and CX probably is in there somewhere. And I actually subscribe to Mallory's thinking that it is everyone. And part of the education efforts that we're planning on doing moving forward is not only educating attorneys and senior leadership on why it's important and why it's good for the business, is educating the entire staff on how it is that their efforts, no matter if they're client facing or not, how they affect the client experience and how it rolls back up. So my function falls underneath the marketing and BD team. Um, our CMO and our chief, our director of business development are really the only two that are like in the weeds with me in our CX efforts. But like I said, I mean, it's, it's across the board. Every single position in the firm really impacts CX. Yeah, uh, one story from my experience, I was uh, doing a CX piece as part of one firm's uh, two-day strategic planning, so I got to see a whole lot of their stuff, and when their, their director of IT, when it got to his uh, time, he was going over their, their technology plan for the year, and they needed to do a whole bunch of laptop replacements, and he goes, yeah, it was a, d a design firm, so you know, big CAD workstations, you know, there's like 12-pound massive laptops, and he goes, yeah, this is probably the best thing uh, for you know, like running CAD, but I was thinking about it. Uh, every time I walk by the conference room and I see these screens up between our people and our clients, it just feels like there's a wall between. So I found this thin and light and the screen folds all the way down and it's viewable from all angles. And so we can put our drawings in this collaborative workspace and it's 10 point multi-touch. So your clients can touch that and zoom in and out too. So... That's, that's an organization where everybody, you know, director of IT, what does he have to do with CX? Well, completely changed how they ran their client meetings just with a piece of technology. So those are the kinds of things to be looking for. If somebody, I actually have to add in a correction too, because if somebody does happen to watch this, we do have a uh, people experience director as well who lives within the HR function and then also an IT director of customer experience. So his goal is to make sure that any interaction with our IT department is seamless because we're all leaving happy. We're not frustrated. Uh, so in that sense, so we have the pieces in play to make sure everyone is thinking the same way. Right. Miss that. So, uh, uh, Another great idea, if you don't have, if you're not large enough to have formal CX roles, each one of those functions in the business, find a CX champion for IT, a CX champion for HR, a CX champion for invoicing, you know, uh, all those different pieces. Uh, that can be a great way to start sourcing um, a more collaborative approach towards CX. Um, question here, uh, what resources would you recommend for someone who is trying to learn about CX? Um, podcasts, newsletters, books, anything along those lines? So when I set on my learning journey to kind of identify what is CX and kind of you know, become the expert at it overnight, um, 
you know, d doing kind of online searching, did not find a lot of books um, on CX that related specifically into professional services, right? A lot would focus on retail or call centers. Um, but one book that I did find that I read, which was very helpful, um, it was called Do B2B Better by uh, Jim Tincher, I believe is his name. And it's specifically for B2B organizations in professional services. So it was very um, germane to us. Now, in hindsight, I think it was like a 300 level book that was probably not the right one to read first. So I'm going to go back and read that again. Uh, but, uh, you know, that was a great one. Uh, one I'm in the middle of reading right now is called Inside Out, uh, which is a very kind of good fundamental book around kind of the, the, the CX paradigm and just really understanding it at a fundamental level. Ryan, you know, architects only read books with pictures, so I, 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 haven't, I haven't found anything yet. Um, I don't really have any book recommendations, but uh, the resources that I've leaned on the most are like folks that I've met here. I mean, I constantly am reaching out to people like, hey, you know, I saw that you're doing this, or I have this idea, can we sit down for a half an hour and talk about it? And there's a few people where I just have standing meetings bi-monthly or monthly, whatever, just to talk about what we're working on, because it is, it's not the most common thing that you run, to, run into CX professionals. So to be here in this, this community and then find people you can kind of latch on to and share ideas with, I think that's the most valuable resource. So on that note, who here would be willing to like meet every other month with someone else in the room and talk CX? Raise your hand. Okay, look around. So uh, everyone can find someone to build that peer network. I encourage you to do that. It's a great I've idea. I've got Eddie. <laughs> All right. Um, do you have any resources? I was going to say people. That's something. Uh look around you. We're, we all like talking to each other. We all get really like, nerdy out about this. Uh, I also found recently, though, I would connect with people on LinkedIn. If I would read a page that I liked, an article, uh, I would connect with them, message them, congratulate them on a great job because I, I, I took value from their work. Before you know it, you will be on a 30-minute call. They're there for resources. I have not met anybody in this industry who is not likable or willing to like nerd out with you about it. Absolutely. Uh, I have spent the last 19 years finding very cool CX people and reaching out being like, hey, like John Goodman, I saw him speak at a conference and I was like, you're awesome. Would you come to CXPS? And this is what your third time, fourth time here? So uh, CX people love talking about CX. So um, if you find them online, LinkedIn, uh, a great resource is there. Uh, you guys ready for a tough question from the audience? All right. Carl, you go first. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, what's, what, yeah, what's your biggest challenge as a CX leader? And to counterbalance that, what has been your biggest success so far? I, and I just go back. The biggest challenge, I think, has been myself. Um, you know, just getting my head and my actions around something that's that's just different and there's no there's no roadmap and no oh yeah you went to school and have this background mm -hmm. so um, so my challenge has been myself um, and I think it's been making the the time for it but I think to me the one the biggest success is is starting to see the firm talk about it and um, when I find myself being introduced as the CXO and, I, and somebody starts saying a little bit about what they think that is. Um, you start going, okay, well, we're, you know, we're, we're you know, baby steps, but we're starting to see that. And I think that, to me, that, that is a success. All right. Um, I would say the biggest challenge is being disciplined enough about waiting <coughs> to build your strategy before diving in, you know, with both feet at the tactics level. Um, I think all of us are super excited to make immediate progress and to demonstrate value and return on the investments that our organizations have made. But having that discipline to kind of stay the course, you know, collect the feedback, design the strategy, implement, um, I think is the biggest challenge. Uh, and in terms of success, I, I think it's something very similar to what you said, Carl, just having people talk about it and it's part of the conversation now. The fact that we've structured our organization around the CX and EX pillars, the fact that we have CX part of every staff conversation, um, it begins to socialize it. And eventually, once it's fully socialized, then I think everybody can start to embody it, live it, and breathe it. 
Yeah, I would actually echo both of those points. The first being, obviously, the discipline to not try and start doing a bunch of stuff right away, which is what I did. Um, <laughs> but I think, too, the pace, I know I mentioned this earlier, the pace at which that things move at a law firm and that this has been, a, different projects have been adopted. Um, I actually had a discussion with my, with our CMO uh, a couple months ago and was like, you know, like, I don't feel like anything's really getting done here. And she's like, what are you talking about? I feel like there's tons of energy around this C, these CX initiatives and like you, you start sitting in these meetings where people are saying that these are great ideas. And it was nice to have that validation to be like, I'm actually, there's actually progress being made here, even if it is slow progress. And I think that that dovetails nicely into what I see as the biggest success is that, like you said, people are talking about it. People s see the value in it. Maybe some people don't yet, but it seems like there's positive momentum that some of this stuff's gonna start getting off the ground and that we're gonna make a positive difference at the firm. Same, right? Again, it's I, the, I tend to look at, so my biggest challenge is looking at the things I'm not doing yet because I want to do it all. I want to own it all. I want to participate in it all. I want my hands in everything. And that is a big challenge that I have to work through is stepping back and knowing that I cannot do it all at once. I've heard a few people say that this, this week, um, but the biggest success, I have to say that our culture does live by this philosophy of the customer, right? That there's, it's not a fake thing that we do for a minute and turn it off. It is very genuine and it's very real at all levels. And that to me is the biggest pride, right? So our superintendents are out in the field. I get to go to a job site tomorrow right down the street. And that person knows that their feedback's coming up. They're excited to have us do the interview. They're excited to get their feedback and their recognition out to the company of how they've created this raving fan. That is my biggest, but that would be mine. That's awesome. Yeah. So another uh, tough question here, and I think a good one. How much autonomy do you have in your role regarding decisions to create change? None. <laughs> <laughs> Managing change is very difficult oh. from our level, right? Because if you're talking about implementing new CX initiatives, uh, again, a lot of them exist or there's something similar that's existing. Uh, if you're looking at taking that feedback and realizing we need to make a process change at our scale, at the size we are now, it is very difficult for me to know who to go to, who is the person who can dictate that change. And again, that's back to the network. So we have to be very, my entire team is constantly networking within our own company. So we know who the right people are to push that down or up. I feel like I'm blessed in that we have 100% buy-in from our entire senior management team. Um, they understand the importance of it, why we put it in place, and the direct correlation with business results. So, you know, generally speaking, we're not going to get hardly any pushback on the initiatives that we're going to put in place that ultimately are going to be good for business. Yeah, you know, I would say I, I have really strong autonomy, and I think one of the nice things is that I'll come back from this conference with a whole list of things, and I'll have an audience that will be willing to listen to it. Right, right. Um, so similar question, uh, how important is demonstrating ROI for the CX efforts at your firm, and what is your approach? It varies for us. Um, you know, again, it's the philosophy, it's from the top, at the very, very highest level, the owner, the CEO, there is no doubt to him. He founded this company based on relationships. It is in our mission statement. So we don't have the uh, pushback, you know, it is in our nature, it's the next job. It is the next 10 years of work with this client. Uh, so as far as requirements or what's expected, it is not as stringent as I believe some people might have when it has to show the technical ROI before you implement change. I don't think we have a real way of measuring except right now our language and our, and our discussion is, you know, how much it costs to get a new employee and how much it, it you know, if somebody's disengaged, what that means to the company. Um, and, and, you know, especially in times that we, we may or may not be facing, um, what's the importance of holding on to somebody that you already know works well with you, you know what they expect of you. Um, so while there's no we don't have metrics, but we are talking the language of, you know, what it might take if you don't have that. Right. And it's just a big enough number that it's compelling, even if it's not a hard measured number, people go, oh, I don't want to see that consequence. Yeah. Right. 
There was a question here, so quick answers from everyone. I think people are trying to contextualize what you're talking about. How big is your firm? So all the way down. Uh, we have about 3,000 employees uh, and revenue. We are looking at 1.2 billion in job awards last year. We're 130 people in two offices between uh, Raleigh and, and Charlotte and, and do work pretty much in a wide variety of not just, not just the southeast, but across the country. We're also 130 employees uh, headquartered in DC, but 100% remote uh, in probably 30 states. We are 500 employees, 350 of which are attorneys, 150 staff headquartered in Cleveland, eight offices. Okay. So uh, I thought I'd give you guys an easy one in between the more difficult ones. I said this might be a good one for you. You talked about it earlier. I uh, love everyone else's uh, thoughts as well. How do you use CX as a filter for new initiatives? Yeah. Um, that basically is the filter through which we design uh, on new initiatives. So um, we've gotten laser focused. You know, our, our motto for this year is do less better. And part of that is making sure that any new idea, be it, you know, however far reaching or smart it may be, supports one of the three pillars, um, which is around our client experience, employee experience, and financial impact. If, again, if it doesn't fall through one of those three buckets, um, we're just going to defer it or say no altogether. Um, and that, that has gotten socialized through the organization. And now when we are having idea, you know, employees who have ideas, they're actually coming to say, this is my idea and this is where it falls, or this is how it can support the employee experience as culture is very important for us, uh, for example. So they've kind of gotten the message um, very quickly. We're only, you know, actually, we're, gosh, we're already in May already. But, um, you know, early in the year, it was very early adoption and it, it just makes smart business sense. And we're just disciplined about using that rubric, if you will, um, as we think through any new project or, you know, idea. So are they bringing you the same kind of decisions and initiatives that they have before, but they're contextualizing it in CX now? Or are you seeing people like kind of fake it into CX just to get it approved? What do you... It's, so it's a little like bit the of the former. It's a little bit of some of the ideas that are driven bottom up. Honestly, I have to use this rubric most often with our CEO, right? <laughs> when she wants to do something new, she has this great idea, this thing that woke her up at three in the morning well, Lisa, let's talk about this. <laughs> How does it put through your own rubric? So it's really holding her accountable and our leadership accountable for being disciplined about not following the next great shiny thing um, along those lines of the EXCX finance and then the do less better. That is something I want to take home. Like the one, you know, you all have your takeaways. That is something I believe that we could start tomorrow and benefit our entire organization. I love that one. Right. So... Um, there's a lot of people here in the room that don't have CX in their title. I know there's a lot of them who maybe have aspirations to have CX in their title or see you know, there's not a lot of CXOs in the world or in the industry. So as an executive destination, the CXO is certainly a destination point. Some of you are there. Some of you are maybe on the journey. What does being CXO mean to you? And if, if you were somewhere on that journey or giving advice to someone on that journey, what does it take to be a CXO? I'll jump in. Um, I think there are a lot of traits that you can have that would be really important. Um, I think, you know, being curious, um, having a sense of humor, being patient, I think all of those are very good traits. Um, I will tell you the one that I think serves me and, and drives me really is passion. Um, and if I were to say it, it's, it, it's passion for people. Um, and I think, you know, helping, uh, helping people get better, helping us as a firm get better, but that also means that our clients have gotten better somehow and that our staff has gotten better somehow. And um, I thought, you know, as I, as I looked at sort of my career and this idea of like making this, this big shift, um, knowing that, well, if I stay just the architect, I can do a building or two every year and that's, that, that will be my impact on the world. Um, in a position like this, um, my sphere of influence now is, is dramatically different. I now can help support 130 people 
do <coughs> amazing things. I can help their clients, our clients, do amazing things. Um, and, I, and again, it just it really goes back to really it's, it's just a passion of watching people um, get better and, and, and accomplish things. So for me, that's that's one of my driving, you know, driving things I think is important. Yeah, and I, I would echo that. And you know, it's about the ability to influence your employees and your clients and your business, right? So it is having that ability to do that. Um, but I would argue, even if you don't have C in your title or CX in your title, um, everybody within your organization can be be their own chief of client experience, right? Whether you're in marketing and, and building your website, whether you're in business development, whether you're in resource project planning or in service delivery or in billing and invoicing or contracts, everybody touches your clients, right? Either directly or indirectly. Everybody can impact and touch your employees directly or indirectly. So having the CX mindset is almost more important than having a CX title. And if you have the ability to influence and lead from within your organization, I think ultimately you might drive your own success towards that CX title at some point. Any thoughts? All right. Um, before I, uh, I started Client Savvy, I was working at an architecture firm and my boss would uh, have an executive coach come in once a month and spend two hours with him and he was always late. And so I'd go sit down with the executive coach because he was there anyway. And uh, um, he uh, uh, told me I needed to get this job called the Vice President of Change. And he says, it's not an official title, it's a mindset. And it's just someone looking around the business, curious, and just goes and stirs stuff up to try to make change happen. So if, if you feel like whoever said you're maybe in the wrong seat to lead CX, Think about your title as maybe VP of change for right now. Make yourself a business card. Don't give it to anyone. Uh, but use that mindset as a tool to think through change through that context of CX and EX. And you go stir stuff up. And you know, um, maybe one day you'll be sitting on a chair like this. So um, we've got a couple minutes left. Uh, there was one specific question for Mallory. Uh, someone wants to hear about the, uh, the listening tours that you mentioned. Yes, uh, we have <laughs> some, that, I love these. So I, we absorbed, my team absorbed the customer tours last year. And when I say customer tours, it is mind blowingly not a tour. This is a full production that we do to host new clients. But the idea behind it is Instead of me telling you, we've talked, I've heard that a lot this week too. Instead of me telling you how great we are, let's pause this, not doing it over the phone. We're going to take you, bring you to our headquarters. That way you get to be fully immersed in our culture. We're not just preaching it and saying it, they get to feel it. So we, and then we curate little moments throughout that. I mean, they're seeing our facilities, they're meeting with the executives. But then we also curate based on why are we working with them? So the, my tour with Dan would be different than my tour with Carl. They're here for different reasons. And with that too is researching the client, getting that intel on the person, what do they like, do they have families, and then making those special magic moments, moments that matter. Uh, they coming in, when, when, this is silly stuff, right? It's easy, but they have kids, we're going to print a picture uh, on a puzzle of the rendering of the project that we might get if they come to our site, right? So now they're going home with an activity for their child. Their child's going to open it up and there's a rendering of the building with power design logo on it. Those are those small little ideas that I think it costs $34. <laughs> That's the moment that they're gonna stick and last and yeah, very big deal. Big, uh, huge company effort and I have to give, if anybody ends up watching this. Uh, no, uh, the amount of pieces in play at the office, the buy-in for those is also significant. It is weeks that can go into planning one of these with seven or eight different teams involved. Wow. Very cool. So uh, um, what advice would you give to members of the audience today? You've been through some battles. You've had some successes. What's your advice? Count, count what you have done. Uh, we're all people pleasers. It goes back to those traits. I think that uh, just being in this, we want things to be better. Everyone in this room, that's, that's one of those correlating trip factors. But be patient with yourself and focus on what has been accomplished in the organization, what you can influence, not necessarily dictate, but you can influence. What can you nudge in the right direction? 
I would just say have a vision. Have a vision of what you think you want it to look like and really try to make that crystal clear because um, I think you know, Walt Disney or somebody said that you know, if, you, if you can imagine it, then you, you, can ha you can have it, you can do it. And I think that that strong vision and, you know, and, and a guiding purpose, those two things together um, are, are, are two, two strong things to, to work with. I would just say keep putting one foot in front of the other and keep moving forward with progress, right? I think it can be very difficult for each of us uh, when you think about the everyday and you don't see progress because it's so far in front of you, but to take that step back as you're continuing to move forward and look at the broader picture. What have you succeeded? What's one more thing we can be doing? What's another easy, no or low cost initiative that we can put in place uh, to help drive that experience? And just to think of it finally as a mindset. I, I love that kind of way to describe it. It's not a, it's not a program. It's not a, you know, design. It's, it's a mindset. And getting everybody bought in on that mindset, um, that's going to drive success. Yeah, I just say appreciate that what you're doing is daunting, and like you both said, take a second to step back and look at the successes that you already have had. I mean, especially if you're at a firm that's just starting up with CX. I mean, we see the numbers here every year. You know, it's growing the CX industry, the CX titles growing, but it's still not huge. I mean, you're doing something that's relatively new, and you're doing something that is a good for the business, b makes a ton of sense, and c you're doing it to really be a good person because you want yeah. people to enjoy their experiences working with your company and who doesn't want to work with somebody that has that mindset like you said. I always take for granted as well that the strategies that we're trying to apply at the organizational level, apply them to what you're trying to do internally too. It's the same concept. Find your promoters, get the feedback. What do you need for me to be successful. Like, how can I help you? And then I can go and achieve that, right? So keep those principles in your daily life. Front forward, front of mind. And I love what Dan said about we're, we're making better people. We're making ourselves better people. CX, EX thinking ultimately is extremely, extraordinarily human. I don't think there's anything more noble you can do than develop yourself and develop the people around you to be more empathetic, more others focused. Uh, my oldest daughter is here uh, uh, doing some, some work today. She can tell you she learned how to fill out uh, comment cards at restaurants, you know, in kindergarten when she learned how to write. So you can educate at home, practice your messaging with the people around you, teach empathy to your children. If you can teach it to a five-year-old, you can teach it to an attorney. So. Uh, uh, um, you know, CX isn't something you do at work. CX is that mindset. It's a way of life. And those of you who adopt it, it will change who you are and you will be a better person. And because it is outward focus, you'll make the people around you better people as well. So, uh, and I would have one quick challenge too. All right. I would, no, I would say when you find somebody exemplifying that, tell them. Mm. Um, because I, I actually, I, I stayed on a Delta <clears throat> flight a couple of weeks ago. I stayed till I got off the plane because the flight attendant was just, was amazing. It, it was just like, I just, I want to know why you're doing what you're doing and what's driving you. Um, so when you see that, you know, when you, when you, when you're, when you have the chance to comment on something or, or give somebody, um, do, do that because just as we're asking that, um, we, we ought to be able to do the same thing. Yeah, uh, speaking of airlines, the Southwest Airlines, if you fly enough, they'll mail, you, they'll mail you kick tail cards. And they're cards you give to Southwest staff who are kicking tail. And when I give those out, it makes people's day. So uh, um, when you see it in your organization, outside the organization, in your family, I recognize the excellence when you see it. Great, great parting words, guys. So thank you very much. We are uh, so appreciative of our panel here. Let's give them a great hand.